Hey there, nation, and welcome to the show where we help you to play miniatures wargaming on a budget. It is I, Commander Cheapskate, and we are back with another episode of Way of the Underhive. This series is dedicated to helping you, brand new players, to Necromunda to learn more about their favorite gangs and their game mechanics for games of Necromunda. And on today's video, we're going to talk about making a starting roster for House Caldor participating in Necromunda Aranthian Succession campaign. So now that the Aranthian Succession is well on its way, and we have several books that have been released so far up to this point, it's kind of important to take a look at the original core starting gangs, especially when it comes to House Caldor, because not only do they receive a bunch of upgrades for their gang as well, they also receive new gang members in the form of road crews as well as way brethren and at the same time with the elevated price of 2000 credits or 2400 credits if you plan on going to the ash waste you could definitely tool up your gang to be really good and really powerful and have them cause a lot of chaos and destruction on the battlefields of Nicaragua. So in this video, we'll talk about the positive and negative benefits of playing in a Wrathian Succession campaign. We'll also talk about how House Caldor uniquely fits within this new campaign setting as well. We'll also talk a little bit about some of the new uh, fighters that they have available to their gang as well, as well as talk about the alliances we would recommend for this gang, as well as any hangarounds and brutes you might have. And then of course, we'll give you guys a starting roster on how to start off your uh, your Caldor gang in an Wrathian Succession campaign, and how about using that gang in uh, that campaign setting as well. So that being said, this will be a little bit more of a deeper dive video i will put timestamps down in the description box below so that way you guys can see that material so you can click and navigate through the video as you want to so that being said let's talk about the aranthian succession so first of all, we're going to talk about the positive and negatives of playing in an Aranthian Succession campaign. So let's start with the positives. You have 2,000 credits that you can spend on your gang whenever you first create it, if you're staying in the Underhive. If you're planning on venturing out into the Ash Waste, you actually have 2,400 credits to play with. And that is what we're actually going to use for our list building for this video. We're going to go assume the fact that you want to play both inside the Underhive as well as the Ash Waste, and so your starting roster will be at 2,400 credits. Now, unfortunately, many people look at that price in increase of 2,400 credits for a gang that you can start with and they get the negative attitude about it. A lot of people assume that they, what you want you to do is to actually spend twice as much money to purchase twice as many fighters to meet that core requirement of 2,400 credits. And actually that's not the way you should actually look at it, right? A lot of people think you should buy a 100,000 point gang and then double it, but they're wrong. In this situation, what you want to go for more is for quality rather than quantity of your fighters and equip your fighters accordingly. So instead of just doubling the number of fighters that you would have in a starting gang, what you want to do is just stick with the normal amount that you'd always have when you first start out a gang, like a box set for example would be perfect, but instead of just buying like really cheap weapons and really cheap equipment, actually equip them accordingly. Give them really good weapons, give them really good armor, give them war gear that you normally would not purchase at the beginning of a campaign and spend your money on that at your point values on that to order to equip your gang. That way you can save a lot more money in an array thing succession. So instead of having 20 fighters in your gang, you maybe just have maybe eight fighters, but they're all fully equipped with everything they need to be successful in your games of Necromunda. And that's actually one of the cool positives of an Aranthian succession is that you can really build really powerful gangs and make them very elite. Now, let's go ahead and talk about the negatives of an Aranthian Succession campaign. And first and foremost, it's going to be the balance bandwagon, especially if the people who are part of that balance bandwagon haven't received any upgrades yet. Unfortunately, Games Workshop just never releases everything all at once when it comes to these new campaign settings. It's kind of like a slow power creep. I guess it's a part of a marketing strategy. Personally, I feel it does a lot more harm than good, in my opinion, but or the situation may be, that's going to be a thing you got to worry about because a lot of balance bandwagon people are going to complain about like how gangs become overpowered and you can exploit too many things and if they're playing a game that hasn't received any upgrades yet, they're definitely going to complain about that. But as always, just ignore their complaints and tell them to put up or shut up or don't play the game. It's that simple. Now, like I said before, many people think that a thousand point gang is and doubling it is the way you go about making a gang for Narathian Succession campaign, but you don't need to do that. In fact, just start with a normal gang that you already Already have on hand and just fully equip them and make them as elite as you want them to be so that way they can survive whatever the underhive or the ash waste throws at them as well. At the same time, another negative about an Aranthian succession campaign is that you may not be into narrative play. If you're not into narrative play, this may not be interesting to you. I'm just going to flat out say that right now. Aranthian uh, Succession has a lot of narrative based uh, scenarios that usually use different gangs and very specific gangs to be in those narratives. So if you don't like playing narrative, this might not be an interest for you. But if you want to use the Aranthian Succession rules to build gangs for different campaigns, I highly suggest that. I think that'd be really cool as well. So now that we're done talking about the positive negatives of playing in an Aranthian Succession, let's go ahead and talk about House Orlock and how it pertains in this new campaign set. 
All right, so let's talk about specifically House Caldor and the Aranthian Succession real quick. So first of all, intently speaking, House Caldor basically has three gangs in one. You can either play a pure, a pure uh, law-abiding Caldor gang, well, as law-abiding as you possibly could be as a Caldor gang, or you can play a full-blown Redemptionist gang just by itself, or you can play a hybrid of the two. Now, in this video, what we're going to do is we're going to focus more on just the law-abiding Caldor side. I'll do a separate video later on talking about Redemptionists. Now, traditionally speaking, when it comes to House Caldor, Caldor has always been a horde-based game, because it's always been its incredible strength. A lot of the fighters are extremely cheap. The weapons they use are also not that great, so they're also kind of cheap as well. So because of that, when it comes to House Caldor game, Traditionally speaking, you always had more fighters than your enemy did because you're going to overwhelm them with numbers, which you're going to do for this. Now, what a lot of people look at the 2400 credit limit for a house uh, for the Ranthian Succession, a lot of people get the idea what you got to do is take a core gang of a thousand credits and multiply it by two. And that's not exactly what I would recommend for this instead. Because, first of all, that's going to cost you a lot of money out of your pocket to do that, all right? And plus, not to mention, a lot of the scenarios don't even allow you to take any more than 10 members per gang anyway. So, doing that is not going to be uh, to your benefit. So because I wouldn't recommend doing that. Instead, what you're going to do is you're going to have a much larger gang because you do have game mechanics, which allows you to bring in extra gangers as well as extra bone picker juvies into scenarios anyways. So you're going to have a horde for a horde gang that's going to be a little bit larger than most of your en enemies. But at the same time, though, you're going to give them better equipment and more template weapons as well. Because the Calder gang does have some better, really good weaponry in terms of close combat weapons as well as really good template-based weapons. So even though their stats are not that great, they're equipment is pretty good and so with that equipped with the larger numbers it's going to really help you dominate on your enemies as well because you can bring in additional fighters uh, with different game mechanics and so that's going to help you out to achieve victory not to mention if you pair these up with the right correct alliances it's really going to tear up your opponents really really well now not to mention because of the new vault of temenos book that was released for the Aranthia succession we now have two new fighters that we can recruit for law-abiding caldor gangs the first guy is the road preacher which is the vehicle crew that you have now for your caldor gang these guys got 30 credits apiece. They have 4 plus plus of skill and plus 7 leadership, cool willpower, as well as intelligence. Uh, they still have the pious uh, special ability to attach these guys. At the same time, they also generate faith dice as well, which is really cool. And as for their skills, they have driving and shooting as their primary with savant leadership as their secondaries. And they have pretty much the same exact equipment list as you can get from uh, normal uh, Cotter gangers uh, for normal vehicle crews. Except they don't get access to auto pistols. They can only get access to reclaimed auto pistols. But that's not such a big deal anyways and of course all the vehicle and equipment you can equip with those guys is really helpful as well now the other fight that we got was the Cawdor way brethren which is a prospect level fight that's cost you 80 credits now these guys are the ones who are mounted on the ritual walkers so they have movement six base they have four plus weapon skill five plus plus of skill they have three strength and toughness one wound eight uh, three initiative one attack they have eight leadership seven cool eight willpower and nine intelligence so they're not really good in terms of psychology stats however though just like prospects, they do have the promotion ability to be promoted to either Cod or Firebrands or Redemptionist Deacons, depending on which way you want to go with these guys. They do have the Born of the Saddle special rule because they do walk on those Ridge Walkers, which makes them move in nine and also gives them one additional initiative. So these guys are initiative two, basically. They do have the Hot Headed as well as Fast Learner skill, but they also have the Pious special rule attached to them as well. Now, their primary uh, skill is on Ferocity with Agility and Combat as secondary. So with these Wave Brethren, they're actually quite good. They can actually be equipped with a variety of weapons. Uh, you have what's known as the Cawdor Charger, which is basically just a, um, a Lance weapon, a uh, pole arm weapon but the lance version of that so they can use that on their uh, their uh, rich walkers they come with uh, auto guns blunderbusses with grape and purgation shot as well as flamers if you want to add flamers to these guys that's a good way to do so as well and they have a backup hand and combat weapon they do have access to the hand crossbow for 10 credits which is just a silent pistol which is kind of nice as well and at the same time they do have access to the frag crack and uh stun lances which <clears throat> They're okay. They're not really all that great because they're not really ranged weapons. They're just mainly close combat weapons using blast temple uh, blast markers in order to attack your enemy, which is kind of cool. But then they don't have any range attacks. I think the charger is a much better weapon, and we'll talk about that later when we get to the rosters. So these are the guys that you have included in your house of Ranthian succession, as with these road preachers as well as way, way brother. Now, another important game mechanic to talk about is alliances. So alliances can have a huge impact on your gang. And if your campaign arbitrator allows you to have alliances, there's a couple you might want to pay attention to. Now, for the Book of Faith that came out for the uh, Cotter guys, they automatically come with a strong alliance with the Corpse Guild, which is a really powerful close combat uh, delegation, the Rogue Factoria, which can get you a bunch of counterfeit weapons, as well as access to the Work Gang, and at the same time also have the Noble House of Co-Iron, which basically gives you uh, uh, Redemptionist level fighters with uh, Eviscerator. 
characters. Now, while those all those alliances are good, and if you prefer to play those, those are perfectly fine. However, in my opinion, the probably the best alliance to make with these guys is the Prometheum Guild. And the reason why is because of all the blaze attacks that Cawdor fighters have access to. Unfortunately, a lot of Cawdor fighters with those blaze attacks have the scarcity plus special uh, weapons trait attached to the weapons, meaning that once they run out of ammo, they're completely gone. Now, there's a couple of ways you can get around this. You can get around this by getting a Promethean tank for a Cargo Rate Ridge Hauler that's going to automatically replenish your blaze weapons, which is going to be kind of nice. But what if you run into a situation where you can't take that vehicle with you? Well, that's where the Promethean Guild comes in because with the Light of Helmar special rule, they remove the scarcity trait for all blaze weapons, which could make it really nice for Kaldar fighters to reload those weapons very quickly and cause all kinds of problems. Another good alliance for these guys would also be House Graham, and the reason why is because of those ammo checks that they get to do with the Finest Ordnance special rule. Uh, House Graham was allowed you to reroll uh, any filled ammo rolls throughout the battle, so that's also really helpful as well. So in case you don't want to take the Promethean Guild, but you want to take House Graham, that could be a really helpful alliance as well. Now let's go ahead and talk about Hangarons, Brutes, and Hired Guns. So when you create your gang, you're probably more often than not going to want to recruit a Rogue Dock. Rogue Dock are important for obvious reasons because they really help you out with those critical injury rolls. And since you can't replenish your losses in the first half of a Wrath and Succession campaign, having access to Rogue Dock is going to really help you out for that one as well. Now as you go on further directly into the campaign, another really helpful one is your house specific Brute, which is the Stig Shambler. The Stig Shambler is an excellent close combat as well as heavy weapons support character. They come with twin length heavy bolters as well as pole arms as well which can be kind of good to use however I suggest you switch out the Heavy Stubber with the uh, Heavy Flamer. And the reason why is because you want to get your Stig Shambler stuck in and close combat as quickly as possible. So that Flamer is really going to help them to achieve that objective and also set your enemies on fire. Plus it synergizes well with your Promethean Guild Alliance stick with a scarcity trait. So it's really going to help you out as well. Now there are a lot more other hanger-ons specifically created for House Caldor, But most of those house specific hanger-ons are outlaw hanger-ons. Which means that only outlaw gangs can take them. Which means they're only going to be really help, be helpful for redemptionist gangs. And this video is not about the redemptionists. I'll make another video about that. So because I'll talk about those guys and how they can help our redemptionists later on. So now that we're done talking about the positive and negatives of being in the Ranthian Succession campaign. As well as playing Cawdor. As well as alliances and brutes and hangarons. Let's talk about your starting roster. As well as how you're going to use those starting rosters with the gang over all right, so let's go and talk about the starting roster as well as the gang overview for your house Cawdor gang for your Aranthian succession. Now, if you notice, I've done something a little bit different usually when I do my rosters. Usually when I have a roster, I just kind of do like a scrolling menu where I kind of show you what everything's going on. Um, so I'm going to do a little bit different, make this a little bit more interactive so that way I can show you exactly what my concept is behind these builds by actually showing you the roster at the same time, giving you kind of like an overview of how this roster would operate against your enemy forces. So let's go and talk about this real quick. So first of all, I'm going to assume that you're going to take the Aranthian succession and you're going to go out into the ash place with it. So we're going to give you 2,400 credits in order to build up your gang. So this gang is going to cost you 2,395, and it's going to cost, and it's going to be following the path of the faithful for the uh, articles of faith that you'll be following for this one. Now, your leader is going to be a word keeper, obviously. It's going to cost you 225 credits. They're equipped with mesh armor with a gutter forge cloak. That way they have a four up armor save with a five up ward save against environmental effects and in the ash waste. There's going to be a ton of them. Now this guy's kind of not as equipped as well with the hand flamer flail as well as the mentor skill. Now his loadout is actually pretty low key. And the reason why is because the flail gives him that plus one of strength to attack. Also if he's mounted a vehicle you can use that ride by rule with that versal trait that's going to help him out. And the hand flamer obviously is to set people on fire. But the reason why you're going to have the mentor skill is because you're going to put him with a group of people that's going to do a lot of fighting and so because of that they take enemies out of action, um, and so long as you these in range, you can give them additional experience points. So you kind of like exploit the experience point gain, help your bone pickers and uh, to level up really quickly. And we'll talk about that a little bit more detail here in a second. Next, we have our fair brand number one. So it costs 350 credits for this character. This character's got mesh armor as well as a gutter forge cloak. Once again, going for that four up armor save with that five up board save against uh, environmental effects. This is going to be a shooting heavy guy. This guy's going to be armed with a heavy crossbow with a frag and crack shells as well as a stub gun with dum dum rounds and flail for backup weapons. They also have a cult icon to increase their activations with activating two fighters. They have photo goggles so that way they can shoot with the environmental effects from the ash waste and they have the parry skill in case they do get engaged in close combat they can kind of defend themselves. At the same time, your 
Firebrand number two. That's going to cost you 220 credits for this character. This character has mesh armor as well as a gutter forge cloak. Once again, going for that four up armor save, five up ward save. Mastercrafted great sword. That way they get re rolls from case they miss with their great sword. And since the great sword is such a powerful weapon with sever, you can really put your enemies out of action very quickly. They have a stub gun with dum dum rounds for a back of weapon for shooting as well as a cult icon to increase their group activation to two. And they have the rain of blow skills. And that way their fight action is only a simple action. And the reason why I want to do that is because the Mastercrafted Greatsword does have um, <clears throat> versatile attached to it so that way you can hit targets from longer range. So if you're stuck in the middle of a massive combat and you got multiple enemies around you, you can use that Rain of Blows in order to really exploit that and chop up your enemies, especially if they get within, uh, within that versatile range of that Greatsword. Now let's talk about you guys' brethren. You have brother number one that costs you 800 credits. That guy's going to be honorably armed with a Gutter Forge Cloak. So you have a 6 up armor save with a 5 up ward save against environmental effects, as well as a pole, uh, Kaldor pole arm with Blunderbuss. Once again, we're going to nerf that uh, uh, that average uh, Blissa skill by using a template blast from the Thunder uh, Blunderbuss. At the same time, we can also set people on fire, which is also really helpful with a purgation shot. We're going to do exactly the same thing with brother uh, number two. It's going to cost exactly the same thing, equipped exactly the same way. Now, brother number three is going to cost you 145 credits this guy's gonna be a little bit different he's got a flak armor with gutter forge cloak even that five up armor save as well as a five up uh, ward save against environmental effect purchase mesh armor for your three brethren as quickly as possible now you might be wondering why are we giving this guy armor the reason why we're giving him armor is because this guy's gonna be packing a long rifle and that's another reason why he's gonna be your specialist in your gang so you want this guy to keep alive so that way you get those longer range shots he's got a stub gun with dum dum rounds as well as photo goggles so that way you can shoot in all environments and he's also got the specialist upgrade because he's your gang specialist when Whenever as possible, try to get a better sight for this long rifle as soon as possible. Uh, telescopic sights are good, but infra sights would be better, so that way you have to worry about light cover, so that can really help out your character there. Then after that, we have two bone tickers, they're going to be equipped exactly the same way at 105 credits apiece with gutter forge cloaks, so they have that 6 up armor save, with that 5 up ward save against environmental effects. They're going to be armor stub guns and dum dum rounds for that strength 4 hit for close combat, as well as flails, so that way they get that strength 4 hit in close combat as well, and they can also entangle their opponents. And they have incendiary charges to set people on fire. What you're going to do is you're going to pair your Bone Pickers with your Word Keeper, so that way your Word Keeper can give them bonuses to XP when they gain it. As well as if they manage to break, if they're within range, they can also get another bonus XP for recovering from that breaking. Then after that we have our Road Preachers, which are our vehicle crew members. We have Road Preacher number, oh uh, sorry, oh, sorry, not Road Preachers, we have our Way Brethren, there we go. We have two Way Brethren in this gang, one and two, they're both equipped exactly the same. Both will have flak armor as well as gutter forge cloaks. They're going to have that five up armor save with that five up ward save against environmental effects. Purchase mesh armor as soon as you can for these guys. And they're also armed with corridor uh, chargers, which are basically just pole arms with the lance special rule attached to them, as well as blunderbusses with brigation shot. So that way they can set people on fire as well and also use those template shots against your enemies. Now these guys are light cavalry guys, so these guys will be perfect for taking on things like other vehicles like Orlock, uh, Outriders, Eschen, uh, Escher uh, Cutters, or even goliath maulers in that situation because you can set those things on fire if you don't wound them and they have to take a cool test in order to pass to be able to activate their vehicles on fire so that could really help you out as well now we get to our road preachers we have our two vehicle operators road preacher number one so it costs you 495 credits that fire is going to be carved with a rock grinder because a vehicle with a weapon stash that way they can get ammo rerolls these guys have got a ram for assaulting as well as tire claws for handling nitro burners for plus one movement smoke vents your enemy suffers minus one hit against you with shooting and twin linked auto cannons because twin link auto cannons are the pwn and they totally destroy in the setting as well as photo goggles so that way they can operate this auto cannon in case of the environmental effects in effect then you have your Kaldor World Preacher number two is going to cost you 200 credits for that character that character is operating a custom medium vehicle with a transport bed with extra armor and boarding ramps so there's no weapons for this vehicle what you're going to do is you're going to pair your way brethren to protect Road Preacher number two because they don't have any weapons uh, as of yet this vehicle is primarily created for transport for your assault teams to get them stuck in as quickly as possible and it causes as much chaos as possible as well. Now you're gonna also hang around, buy a hanger on for this one as well, which is gonna be a road dock. It's gonna cost 50 credits because for obvious reasons, you're gonna want that road dock to take care of your people. At the same time, if you do allow alliances with your Aranthian campaign, if your arbitrator allows you to do so, I highly suggest you take a guild alliance with the Prometheum Guild. Since this is a Cawdor gang and not a Redemptionist gang, they will automatically be law-abiding, and that way they can make that alliance with the Prometheum Guild. And the reason why you want that is so that way you get that removal of the scarcity traits against your flammable weapons for your blaze weapons. That's going to really help you out in this campaign. Not to mention the Pyromantic Conclave is also no slouch either. In fact, your Pyromantic Conclave will actually make up your second assault team. That's going to include your Pyrocane Lord, who's got a Refractor Field, a Shock Stay Blast Pistol, as well as the Evade and Overseer skill. Your Pyromajor, who's got to have a Refractor Field, as well as a Flamer, with a Stub Gun Occult Icon with Nerves of Steel. 
So that way they do get shot, they can escape pinning, they can set people on fire. M Smam that Overseer ability from the Power Cane Lord on your Power Major, so that way they can set people on fire twice in a row. Then you have your two Cinders. I suggest you equip them both with Last Pistol and Axes for close combat support. Those Photon Flash Grenades are really going to play uh, Merry Hell with your enemies because they're going to take away their activation markers, which allow your Cawdor guys to swarm these guys and destroy them. And of course you have your Spring Up skill for these guys to uh, uh, get out in case they get shot. So that's going to help you out as well. So that's going to make up your starting roster on this one so now that we're done with the starting roster we're gonna show you how the starting roster works on the battlefield with this little um, strip map that I have over here to show you guys exactly how it's gonna work out all right so now that we're gonna talk about your starting roster what that's gonna include so is gonna be a very large list of people to fight in your gang let's go and talk about exactly how you use in the battlefield so here is my gang overview so I decided to make this little strip map to make things a little bit easier for you guys to see and visualize exactly how you're gonna go about using this gang especially in your campaigns so let's pretend this is the battlefield that you're facing against and your enemy is deployed here now if your enemy is smart and most of your opponents will be they'll divide up your gang their gang into two assault um, uh, two elements just like you would for your own gang with your own fire teams your enemy might have a, a support fire team of some sort as as well as an assault fire team of some sort, just like what you're gonna do. Now, when you deploy your gang in, in, in the battlefield, if you're able to deploy it this way, what you're going to do is you're going to put most of your characters on your vehicles. Your rock grinder is going to be your support team number one. Your support team is going to consist of your firebrand number one. That's the guy that's armed with the heavy crossbow as well as brother number three. That's the guy who's operating the uh, long rifle as well as a road preacher who's going to operate the road uh, the rock grinder's assault cannon. Now what you're going to do is you're going to open fire with this vehicle. What you're going to do is you're going to take this vehicle and of course you move up into some kind of position here. And then from there what you're going to do is you're going to actually support fire by actually shooting different f targets at range in order to suppress your enemy okay so what's gonna happen is your road preacher is gonna probably open up uh, with the auto cannon take on enemy vehicles take on enemy high value targets brother number three is gonna snipe at people as well while firebrand number one lobs attacks using their heavy crossbow now what's gonna happen from there of course is that these three guys which is going to be one of your assault teams that's consists of firebrand number two which is the guy who's armed with a great sword as well as brother one and two which are the guys who are armed with the pole arms now what these guys are going to do is they're going to quickly dismount is what they're going to do real fast oh sorry i can't be able to do that i guess that's right though they're going to dismount what they're going to do is they're going to try to find another area of attack so that way they can flank around their enemies kind of like this so that way this assault team moves through around attacks people with template attacks also hit people with those great swords and assault through as well now while that is occurring with your support element your next assault element is going to consist of this team over here now your secondary assault element is going to consist of your custom medium vehicle with road preacher number two now this one's going to have the most fighters on it it's going to have your ward keeper as well as your two bone pickers as well as your pyromantic conclave you're also going to have your two wave brethren as well now the wave brethren act as security to protect your custom medium vehicle because one you have a lot of fighters who are on this vehicle so it's going to be a prime target for enemy to target it and secondly because it doesn't have any weapons at all to protect itself so what's going to happen is this this. So imagine your Wave Brothers act kind of like acting as a screen. They're going to try to assault forward as well towards your enemy. Oops, let's try to undo that real fast. They're going to try to attack your enemy as well, providing suppression against this enemy right here while this custom vehicle gets into an exposed flank of some sort. Hopefully you'll be able to flank it from the right-hand side, if not go completely from behind if you can, using your Wave Brother as uh, shields in order to protect your advance. But whatever the case may be, find whatever is available for you and makes it a little bit easier. So as you move your vehicle up to attack your opponent what you're going to do is you're going to disembark your two uh, members of your two assault teams your assault teams consist of your uh, your work keeper as well as your two bone pickers now those guys of course will assault forward as well as with your pyromantic conclave have your pyromantic conclave move at first because if these guys get tagged it's not going to cost you anything because they automatically replenish instead have these guys instead use their different uh, let's see here let's use a little thunderbolt icon there have them use their photon flash grenades in order to impact your enemy as well and cause them all kinds of problems because if you can do that if you can set up your photon flash grenades and blind these enemy activators they won't be able to do anything for you and then your pyromantic conclave can go through and sweep up some guys using flamer fire now while that's occurring of course have your word keeper and bow picker also move up forward finish off any people that have been seriously injured uh, with crew de gras or have them assault forward in close combat and hurt them that way the word keeper can set people on fire still with their hand flamer while the bone pickers can then of course engage people in close combat finish off people who are under the blaze condition or the case may be now if you'll notice what's going to happen here by doing this you're attacking enemies on three fronts you have one on the flank here one on the front time uh, one on the front area as well so be engaging this way with the Ray brethren at the same time you will also be uh, attacking from the right hand side as well 
This is where the strength of Cawdor Gangs come in, because Cawdor Gangs traditionally outnumber their opponents because their fighters are so cheap. So by engaging your enemy this way in a three-way envelopment, they're going to catch them in multiple crossfires, where they're going to be really pressured upon and also hurting quite a bit. Not to mention, you have a lot of uh, template weapons going off, so you can hit off multiple enemies at exactly the same time. You have some really powerful weapons as well taking place with blast effects, with incendiary charges, as well as your heavy crossbow also at work. Not to mention, you got higher strength weapons with your assault cannon as well. And you can also do really good with your close combat because almost all of your close combat attacks in this list will give you plus one of your strength. So for most gangs, you're winning on three ups. And for those who are a little bit tougher, at least four up for some of those guys. Now, in some strange cases, you have to worry about five ups because, for example, like your uh, Goliaths, for example, but that's not going to be much of a big difference on that one. Not to mention, to forget, you also got those Lance abilities from your Ray Brethren to give them that additional strength bonus to their attacks when they charge your enemy as well. And this is exactly how you'd go about using this army, this gang, in your games of uh, Ash Waste. Now, of course, obviously, if you can't use your vehicles, you just do exactly the same thing but without the vehicles, and you can still destroy your enemy that way as well. And this is the gang overview of how you'd use the starting rosters in your Aranthian Succession campaign. So in conclusion, upgrading your gang to an Aranthian Succession campaign is a great way to fully equip your gang with powerful weapons, war gear, as well as vehicles. With new vehicles dropping all the time, this can be a really fun way to equip the gang of your equip your gang of your dreams and bring them out into whatever situation you want to run into. Now, I wouldn't stress about doubling the size of your gang, like I said before. The reason why is because a lot of the scenario rules that you actually see that are out there uh, still limits the number of fighters you can take. So don't worry about doubling the size of your gang. Rather, take the gang that you have and really concentrate the equipment that they take with them so that way they can really survive whatever goes their way. Remember, in a Ranthian succession, quality reigns over quantity with your gang builds, so always keep that in mind. And as always, I will be dropping new videos on this topic for the Ranthian succession with other gangs to help you out on your Nick and Linda journey. So that's good for this for you guys. As always, please feel free to like, comment, and or subscribe. Your guys' input is invaluable to us as always. Also, check us out on Facebook, Instagram, as well as blogger.com for all the latest, greatest hobby news related to this channel. That's good to do for this one, you guys. I will catch you guys next one. Peace out and stay classy.